Hello, Brad Nelson here again. I thought I'd take a minute and show you some of my student models. These are um, college students who have just learning um, Flexum for the very first time and with a couple weeks of workshopping have been able to build the models that I'm going to show you. So just very quickly, here's a model of a um, steel bar turning operation. Um, I'll just run the model here. So they got three operators assigned, uh, steel bar arrives at the system. And this is one of the things that Flexum's quite nice at is simple three-dimensional uh, graphic systems. And these students were able to go online and find free public domain models that have been uh, developed by other people and made available on a simple website. Um, and so downloading these three-dimensional models um, or three-dimensional um, machine models uh, makes the system look quite realistic. So it's fed into a um, some kind of a turning machine or a milling machine. Uh, it's taken to a secondary machine, maybe first turning, second turning. Um, now, they haven't labeled, they've said processor one, two, three, for example, which is not as helpful as you might like. It would be better if these were labeled so we you know, could get a sense of exactly what was going on at these different um, stations. But operators are moving material from station to station. So this is a fairly simple model. Uh, our class is uh, kind of focused on quality assurance. So it's kind of nice to see that they've added a QA module here. Let me just speed this up a little bit. So then the parts go through uh, a coordinate measuring machine, they get inspected, and this group has built in some logic, which is kind of cool to um, show whether the parts have either been accepted or rejected. Um, and presumably, if I let the model run fairly quickly, we'll get some small percentage of rejections like this. Right? So there's all kinds of logic that you can build into these models as well. And a shout out to uh, Diana and Sukraj for building that model. Okay, here is a model of a painting line. This is a group of students who worked for a local company that ran this operation. So they've taken times from the uh, their experience, right, working at this company, uh, did some estimated times of the different process steps. Now I'm showing this running at eight times speed. Right. So this is why things are moving really quickly. So product is coming in. Um, I think in this case, they're um, uh, developing painting uh, or painting cans. Um, okay, so there's a straining system, goes into the queue. You can see the material shape changes as the material is being processed. Then there's a grinding operation. I've got a nice little robot doing a little kind of pick and place thing, pulling things out of the queue and loading them up into the uh, barcode printer. Um, there's a quality inspector who's running product through an inspection system. And now a little, maybe a little bit unrealistic, but picking up from <laughs> straight off of the quality control machine, off of the inspection machine uh, with a forklift truck. Uh, but nevertheless, then delivering the material out to the customer. Okay, so a very simple line, um, but this is a great start for, for people who have never used or even heard of discrete event simulation before running um, and, and uh, attempting to run this kind of software. Uh, one of the other things that um, I'll talk about in the future video tutorial is how to set up these dashboards. So for production, of course, these are super useful for us to monitor the processes so we can see that these, this is a built-in, these are built-in charts. So you just need to point at the objects that you want to monitor. And so they've picked the operators um, and the different transporters and just showing, you can see by the bar chart, the colors, how often they were working, uh, how often, how much time they were spent or what percentage of their time was spent carrying materials uh, waiting for materials, loading, unloading, and so on. And then in this second chart here, showing about the um, output of the different machines. 
So that's kind of cool. So shout out to uh, Aravind and Ajo for doing that. Here's another model created by a pair of students who worked at a plant that made um, a seal riser for um, a model of car. Um, so I'll let this run. And again, they took some timing from the actual process. Um, so with the cutting operation, for example, happened every 15 seconds. And there's a welding operation that happened every um, 18 seconds, for example. So they've tried to reproduce the timing. I left in these connections. So you can sort of show the or see the flow path. Uh, the material follows. Um, and again, this is where a discrete event simulation software comes in really nice or this sort of digital modeling or digital twin because you you're not just creating a CAD drawing right you're creating a working model uh, where you've defined the flow path for material and you've defined at each stage uh, how long it takes to do each operation uh, cycle times or setup times that sort of thing <laughs> now I noticed that this forklift truck kind of drives into the ground, which is a little bit strange. So I guess this model placement um, isn't quite right. Maybe we need to, maybe instead of having it into the basement, we'll have it run flat on the ground. Um, you know, so it goes through a milling operation into a queue, uh, out here to welding. What are we using? Uh, the SketchUp has a, a uh, website called um, 3D Warehouse, 3D Warehouse, and it has beautiful collection of three-dimensional models of, you know, milling machines and industrial equipment and so on. Okay, so for the, um, they can also define how many people are operating any given station. So in this case, they've chosen to have two different welders, and this helped balance the flow through. They recognized that welding operation was a bottleneck in the process so by assigning more operators right you can you can modify the uh, modify the bottlenecks or cure the bottlenecks you can test what if scenarios you know what if we had more people what would the productivity do and that's where all these different metrics come in handy you can you can measure output and flow through um, lead times and so on and see how adding some kind of additional resource extra equipment or extra people modifies your model. Um, a shout out to uh, Niket Kumar and Ranveer for building this model. Okay, and these students again have modeled a process from a place where they work. And uh, in this case, they make uh, foam mattresses. So they bring in uh, foam and fabric from the supplier in rolls. Um, Right. So they found something that kind of approximates their um, laminating machine, then uh, cutting the blocks, uh, a couple of molding machines, die cutting, finally an inspection, and again the inspection process you can see is, has two output paths either for uh, finished good parts or rejected goods. So. Um, this, along with some a very clean dashboard showing the you know the, the progress and the different conditions and states. Uh, so it shows, for example, the laminating operator has been much busier than the molding operator, who's only been sort of overall occupied for four percent of the model time, where the laminating operator has now been occupied for thirty-eight percent of the uh, production time. Right. And then this can suggest management decisions and so on. So, so these are, these kinds of models are so useful for so many different things and for, for so many different functions. Okay. But the visualization of this, I think is important. I, I can't really understate how important it is to um, not only find sort of nice objects or something that's a little bit representative, at least of the real production equipment or real processing, um, also changing the look of the materials so that it's not just a generic sort of um, brown square, looks like a cardboard box or a sort of a generic sphere going through it, right? So you have, you're modeling the product with something visual, you're representing the process with something visual, 
the layout is represents a, a realistic kind of a layout. It's nicely organized. This model is, you know, nicely labeled. You can see you don't have to understand the process to know that this is a die cutting, that these are molding machines, that this is cutting the blocks, right? We, we know that this is foam inventory. We know that this is fabric inventory. Uh, so all of that for me as a, as a, as an instructor or as a user or manager looking to, you know, learn something from this model, all of that is important to, to help kind of understand what's going on and understand the model. Okay, and so this pair of students has done a particularly good job of that. So again, shout out to uh, Dylan, Ethan, and Noren. Uh, great job. One last thing that I want to point out um, is you can see over here uh, model limit reached, and this comes along with the the limitation of using the free version of FlexSim. The free FlexSim is fully functional almost fully functional there's some very high-end functions that we can't access um, but i've never run into that sort of a limit with the kind of exercise that we need to do every element that we drag and drop into our model whether it's a queue or a processor or an operator or a forklift or just a graphic element like these vans they all count against the model size and the free version of flexim has a limit of 30 elements so if we count it up, there would actually be 30 elements in this. So the students have maxed out on what they can put in. So if there was a second inspection station, we couldn't model it here. We would have to give up on something. We'd have to take, a, take out a pretty van and replace it with a, with a second inspection station. If we wanted to add more operators, if we wanted to right, add extra complications, we couldn't do it. Now, having said that, there's other ways of optimizing. So they've used separate elements. To, to show these different sort of colored spaces, but we could replace all that with one JPEG of a floor plan that would show up underneath, right? So there's different ways that we can optimize and you can actually build a pretty substantial model with the, within the 30 limit, 30 model element limit in free flex in. So shout out again to the two students, Dylan, uh, Dylan Ethan and uh, Noran who built this model. Uh, great job. Thank you very much. Hope that's been informative. I think it's kind of useful to see what you can create with a little bit of effort in uh, when you're still learning how to use this software. Thanks very much. I'll see you next video.